Welcome to the first of our four Spring 2015 Public Scholarship Professional Development Workshops. Um, inaugurating this series uh, is our social media workshop. And our facilitators for today on my left are Megan Wach Megan Watcha. Megan Watcha, who is uh, the Scholarly Communications Librarian at the Central Office of Library Services for CUNY. And Robin Davis, who is the Emerging Technologies and Distance Services Librarian at our own Lloyd Seeley Library. Uh, we'll also be joined briefly after um, Megan and Robin have uh, presented by Michael B. Smith, who is Assistant Professor of Communications Technology at York College and is in charge of special projects for the CUNY Academic Commons, our own social network, our, uh, our native social network here at CUNY. And also Michael's colleague, Sarah Morgano, who is uh, in the Academic Operations Office of the CUNY School of Professional Studies and a communications facilitator for the CUNY Academic Commons. So uh, hopefully we'll get a lot of good content in today. And please, uh, if you've got questions, um, I'll leave it to the facilitators decide, to decide how they want to handle them. But we will certainly make some time at the end of the workshop for folks to ask questions. Uh, without further ado, Sarah and Megan. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, excuse me for a moment while I awkwardly switch the microphone around. Okay. Um, so uh, first, thank you all uh, for coming out today. Um, I'm really excited to be here and talk to you all about my platform, um, CUNY Academic Works. Um, so taking a little step back before we jump right into it, The internet has given us the ability to find information about and generated by our peers, our friends, and our colleagues, quickly and efficiently. It has given us ways of um, connecting, sharing our scholarship, and of, um, in some cases, rethinking the time-honored tradition of ridiculous cat photos and memes. And this here is, um, one, my icebreaker, and two, uh, lolcats. Uh, and if you are unfamiliar with lolcats, um, they have a particular way of speaking. I can has. And sometimes there is the rare moment in which the cat, the public, the social, and the scholarship come together. as in the Twitter hashtag, I can has PDF. This is a movement in which researchers, scholars, members of our community um, don't have access to the scholarship that they need in order to be successful. And so they request this scholarship from their peers via Twitter. I can has PDF. This comes from something uh, that is intricately linked to the founding of CUNY Academic Works, uh, our new open access institutional repository, something that we in the um, libraries refer to as the serials crisis. Rising costs of journals have um, drastically outmatched inflation and our library's budgets, affecting our users to access to information through our libraries and in their daily lives. Yet pu uh, publishers' profit margins continue to rise. And in fact, they often outpace those of companies like Starbucks, Apple, Disney, and Google. So that this has really become a crisis in how information is both accessed and used. The scholarly publishing system was established in order to support the principles of academic freedom. And the way that it has um, worked, and here is a slide developed by my colleague at the Graduate Center, um, Jill Ciracella, is that the university pays the faculty members to conduct the research. There are certainly other um, funding coming in as well. The, publish the, pub the faculty members publish that research. They do not get paid by the publisher. The publisher does not pay them to write the article, to review the article, or to edit the article. 
And then the university buys back that article, that information, for millions of dollars. So in response to this crisis, we now have the open access movement. And when I say open access, I mean access and ideally use to information without legal, financial, or technical barriers. So essentially, free to read to anyone with an internet connection. This very much returns scholarly publishing back to its original purpose, to disseminate knowledge and to allow that knowledge to be built upon, as opposed to supporting a model which supports an information divide. So I assert that when we use the term open access, when we think about participating in the open access movement, it can, also, it can often feel like something new, as something other, as something outside of our work, but in fact, it is very much a pragmatic solution to a real problem in scholarly communication, in how your research is made accessible and built upon, whether that's um, you know, via the traditional scholarly article or via a tweet on Twitter. The open access movement has gained a lot of momentum over the past few years um, from federal funding mandates um, requiring that if your work is um, supported by public tax dollars, that it is made accessible to the public, to the first state open access policy passed by the, um, California just a couple years ago. And so it should come as no surprise that um, the City University of New York is a part of this movement. This is the University Faculty Senate's statement and resolution on open access passed in 2011, um, which um, to me is very much a guiding document in the development of this new platform. Particularly the statement, uh, whereas the City University of New York is committed to educating the public and making knowledge accessible and affordable. This is something um, that is intricately tied to the mission of the college and the university. And so now we have CUNY Academic Works, a single site to browse and search the scholarly and creative output created here at John Jay and at the City University of New York. And when I say scholarly and creative output, I mean in all of its forms, from the traditional journal article and book to um, creative works, poetry, dance performances, data sets, open educational resources, all of the rich content that is part of the scholarly record. So why should you consider sub, um, submitting to academic works? First, yes, there is a very much a social justice issue, a response to the I can has PDF, because just by a show of hands, how many of us have conducted a Google search um, and come across an article and been asked to pay 30, 40, 50 dollars? And we don't even know yet if we want to read that article. We aim to promote collaboration within and between campuses. So our office is making sure that that content is discoverable um, via the library systems, OneSearch, promoting possible collaborations, increasing this social aspect. We provide increased visibility um, via search engines such as Google, Google Scholar, and Bing. Content can be in integrated into your um, Google Scholar profiles and linked out to other platforms such as your profile on Academic Commons, your faculty profile, all of these places. And this very tangibly leads to increased citation rates. Um, so, uh, you know, we went through a number of different studies. Um, maybe four were inconclusive. 27, however, showed a very clear um, advantage to making your work available open access, to letting it be a part of the scholarly conversation. Um, in fact, depends on your discipline, um, but by making your work available open access, the ranges from 200 
to 600% more likely to be cited. So this is also about raising our research profile as individuals and as the um, college. It allows us to preserve and share our work in a single place, then communicating that out through all of our other platforms. And as a result of bringing your content into academic works, you will receive monthly emails telling you just how often that, count, that content has been downloaded and viewed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is such a great question. Um, so, I'm going to talk a little bit about the differences between academic works and academia.edu um, in a moment. They certainly offer many of the same services, and there are places where they connect and places where they diverge. In terms of, um, and you asked your question at the perfect time, um, in terms of work that we've already published, that we've um, already added to the record, um, the first question is one of rights and one of copyright. Um, this, uh, you know, the Constitution gives us the right um, to protect our intellectual property um, immediately after our uh, right to form a post office. And, um, but many times before publishing, authors sign a copyright transfer agreement. One of the things that we do in my office um, and work with other librarians um, to do with their faculty is to support scholars in publishing where they want to publish and still keeping their rights. And this is done very simply. You can opt to submit an addendum to that copyright transfer agreement. So this is a very simple document um, where you go to uh, scholars.sciencecommons.org, um, put in your title, name, identify the rights that you want to be able to um, retain, and it will automatically generate the document and all of the various legalese that is required. Um, and this is really um, useful, not just for submitting to academic works, but also because maybe five years, 10 years from now, you want to rework that article, and you want to publish it as a part of a book or in a collection of works. And this means that you will have the right to do so without having to go back to your publisher and request permission or possibly pay them for the content that you created. But many journals have already responded to this need, to the open access movement. And there is a tool that allows us to very quickly identify the default policies of a journal. Do they allow you to keep the preprint, the version that you submitted, the final accepted version, the postprint, or the publisher's PDF. So just by going to this site, typing in the name of the journal, it will very quickly give you this information with clear check boxes. And at times, as is the case with this publication, um, a journal might require a temporary embargo period. And one of the really nice things about the platform, um, CUNY Academic Works, is that when you're submitting that content, you can identify an embargo period, a time for which that work is not made public. So six months, a year, um, and it will set a clock. At the end of that period of time, it will automatically be set free, made public, part of the scholarly record. As I said, CUNY Academic Works also looks to collect beyond the journal article. There are so many incredibly rich events that happen here at John Jay's campus. Um, conference proceedings that might go up on a website. Um, and, you know, three years from now, those links rot. We can bring them into the repository, make them more discoverable, provide preservation, and give them a second, a third life. We also accept individual presentations, data sets, open educational resources. So going back to your question, what about academia.edu? What about services like ResearchGate? In an effort not to get too complicated between the advantages and the disadvantages, uh, something I do love to do, um, 
both Academic Works and Academia.edu will make your content public. They will provide increased discoverability, um, although I will add that Academic Works will be tweeting your content um, and uh, working with central communications to make sure that it's disseminated via emails, listservs that already exist within our community. Both will give you some sense of how often that content is being downloaded and viewed. But where we begin to divide is the long-term um, parameters of working with each platform. So, um, one, academia.edu does provide you with a profile. In the case of CUNY Academic Works, in our first iteration, we are just um, three months off the ground and one week off the ground, uh, actually two days, um, for John Jay. Um, I will say, this is not yet. Future iterations, um, you know, we anticipate being able to feed into faculty profiles, and no matter what, right now, by putting your content in the repository, you will receive a permanent URL, which you can include on your CV um, and link to from any um, social media site that you're working with. Yes? That is such a great question. So the question is, how do you drive traffic to the content that is in the repository? And so um, we are working with a company um, that works very closely with Google and their black magic algorithm um, to make sure that when uh, someone is searching Google Scholar, that CUNY content is made that much more discoverable. Librarians are using their expertise to add additional levels of metadata. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of different actions um, you know, librarians are information professionals, and so, you know, we're linking to a lot of different content, we're tweeting it out, and as more content is added and read, we can be sure um, that this content will be increasingly more and more discoverable. Where we really begin to see the divide, though, is between privacy and long-term preservation. So sites like academia.edu and ResearchGate, they are commercial ventures. So when you bring your content in and you start accessing the content of your colleagues, they begin to sell your data. Um, this is a concern to some, it is not to others, but it is definitely something that it's important to be transparent about. Um, they are also going out and crawling the internet, identifying other citations and creating profiles um, for members of John Jay, sometimes without that um, you know, person's input. Um, but really, it's a matter of privacy protection, copyright guidance, and long-term preservation. So five years, 10 years from now, academia.edu may not be here. But CUNY Academic Works will. The university makes a commitment to you and offers as a part of its suite of services, you know, we can consult with you about the copyright, about your book, um, or about the next journal article that you publish. I will also say that when academia.edu receives a takedown notice, because perhaps you didn't have the rights to make that work publicly accessible, as a commercial venture, it immediately removes that content from the repository. Um, however, we in the libraries, as content comes in, if we receive a takedown notice from Elsevier, as happened here, we will temporarily remove your content, but we will ask Elsevier to prove that they are indeed the copyright holder. We will serve as your advocate in consultation with you. And so for me, this is really exciting. Um, I hope it is exciting to you because as content comes in to the repository, we have an opportunity, yes, to meet this real social justice need to respond to the call of I can has PDF, um, but we can also really raise our research profile, our public image. And as content comes in, it goes back out into the world. So um, this is a screenshot of the, um, the Graduate Center has about a thousand dissertations in the repository. And this is a single day of traffic telling us exactly who downloaded the content, letting us see the true global public impact of making that work accessible. 
one which will be increased as we tweeted out, as we included on our profiles in all of our various social networking systems. So I am here to answer any questions. Um, but first, I just wanted to briefly demo how to submit to academic works in case this is something that you want to participate in and be a part of. So the first step is to go to academicworks.cuny.edu and uh, this URL is available um, on the handout that has gone around the room. It does require um, creating an account. Um, we encourage everyone to use their John Jay email um, so that we can very quickly, um, you know, identify that you are a part of this community, um, but you can use any email that you would like and I'm just going to uh, log in. Okay, so now that I've logged in, I simply select Submit Research. I select the series, um, publications and research generated by John Jay College. I am then asked to sign a submission agreement. This submission agreement identifies that yes, you have the rights to bring it into the repository and if you're unsure, we are here to consult with you and to support you. Um, and it grants CUNY a non-exclusive license to, to make the content accessible in the repository. So this means we can put it publicly on the web in academic works, um, but we will have to come back to you um, if we want to do anything else with it. And other members of the public will have to contact you um, if they want to do anything else with the work. So yes, I agree. And then it's simply, you know, a matter of adding some basic fields. Title, author, my name is automatically generated, your name will be as well. Um, you can add names of any additional co-authors that you may have. The type of document and when it was created. As I said, you can add a temporary embargo period any keywords, the abstract, and then you simply upload the content and hit submit. It is a very simple process. If you can send an email, you can bring your content into Academic Works. Um, and so I am happy to answer any questions uh, that you may have, um, I guess, at the end um, or now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I guess that in the screen before, in the step before, where it says copyright, there is where I will send you the email. <laughs> or call you and say, what about this? So, not just about academia.edu, but I just, you know, um, is it too late now to negotiate my copyright to read the publishers that I just, you know, in contract with? Yeah, that's a great question. It is never too late to negotiate your rights. Um, and in fact, um, many publishers expect that you will, um, whether we're talking about a journal article or a book or book chapter. Um, and in many cases, um, they will allow you to revert rights, particularly for books that may have been written a few years ago um, or book chapters. Um, and we are very happy to provide that language and to consult with you about how to do that. Um, we, uh, you know, th that is one of the many services that we at OLS will provide. Great, okay, so um, thank you so much. I'm going to pass the uh, social media torch uh, to my good colleague, Robin.
very gladly. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Okay. It's what? Oh, I'm just too short. Okay. Uh, hello, my name is Robin Camille Davis, and I am the Emerging Technologies and Distant Services Librarian here at John Jay's Library. Uh, and today I am talking about your presence online as a scholar. So as an academic, uh, your reputation within academia uh, as a scholar is defined by your output, by your collaborations, right? Um, but you have a public presence too. You have a, a sort of public face that you present to the world and that is your digital presence. Uh, so the title of my talk is Your Business Card is the Internet. And I really do mean that. Uh, business cards are a way to exchange contact information, remember other people, make connections, and make an impression. Uh, one of the ways your business card is the internet is what people see when they search for you. So this happens all the time. Uh, you know, somebody reads a paper that you just published or a book that you've written or you're presenting and people are you know, Googling you uh, or you're applying for a job or someone's applying for a job to work with you. People are already looking for your name all the time online. Uh, so with that in mind, um, how many of you have Googled yourselves recently? Oh, great, awesome. Okay, a couple hands. Uh, so I would actually like you to Google yourself right now so you can see what I'm talking about. So take out your phones, your tablets. I see some laptops out there, and I'll do this along with you as a demonstration, right? Uh, let me finagle this here. Okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, let, me, let me start out this here. So also note that when you're, at least when you're using a, the desktop version of Google, that there is, uh, if you're signed in, there's a, there's a personalized version of your search results, which sort of, you know, looks at what you've looked for before and kind of tries to tailor it to your interests. But there's also what they call a global search results, which still knows stuff like, you know, where you are in the world and what time of day it is, but it sort of filters out what it thinks is personal. So look at your global results to see what you are. Okay. So. The ideal thing is for all the results on the first page of these search results uh, to be under your control. So that is, they are things that you created, like profile pages, your, oh, hold this up here. Um, uh, like profile pages, your own website, things you've written, uh, or there are things that you've allowed to be created about you, things like interviews or like, like uh, writer's profiles for places that you write, right? Um, so that way you have control of your image. You have control of the way that people uh, sort of learn about you and who you are and what you're about. Um, so, okay. On this page, as a demonstration, I'm gonna count up all the things that I have control over here that are results about me, right? So I have, okay, my website, my about page, pictures I've uploaded, my Twitter account, my LinkedIn, an interview with me, my academic commons page, a few more commons pages, uh, and something else that I wrote somewhere else. So lucky me, all the things that I have on this front page are things that I have control over. Now, you know, I'm by no means famous and I, you know, don't know how much I actually am Googled, but this to me is really important because this is what the world sees of me when they look for my name. So now it's your turn. Look at the search results of your name uh, and count up the things that are under your control. Uh, things that you've created or things that you've allowed to be created about you. And don't count up things like write my professor because nobody wants that. Have, 
Have we all counted? Who here is lucky enough to have 100% of those search results on that page about them? Oh, awesome. Well done. Good job, you guys. <laughs> uh, how about uh, in the realm of uh, eight search results? Yeah, under your control? Uh -huh. Five? Cool, awesome, yeah. Uh, what about, um, what about uh, search results uh, with your name that are not about you, that are about, that are about somebody else with your same name? That's actually, that's, that's why I go by this, by this three name, Robin Camille Davis, like a child actor, because there are so many Robin Davises out there that are, you know, the volleyball coaches or the realtors, and they were all showing up before me. That's why I go by this, by this trifecta here. Um, was there anything that, that surprised anyone, or things, things that are interesting that you want to share that are surprising to you? You didn't know that you were on Instagram. Is it someone else with your same name, or is it you? I guess it's the same name. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. A lot of images that are not you. Yeah, yeah. I, I see the same thing for myself. I'm, I'm all kinds of people, apparently. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, Pinterest shows up really high in search results. It's really, it's kind of annoying, to be honest. You know, unless you're really into, you know, redecorating your home office or whatever. <laughs> I have a question. Uh -huh. what, what do you mean by in control? That, that we create right. it, that we can download it, and disappear, you know, make it disappear? Right. So, so I do admit that, that being uh, in control is kind of a fuzzy term. Here I just mean things that, you know, that, that you created or things that were created about you that you allow to be up, and you do still have some, you know, modicum of control over it. Things that you can delete if you want to. Um, things that, that you're not in control of are things like rank my professor or, um, you know, sometimes your name will come up for like the white pages or the, or the yellow pages, things like that. Uh, yeah. Or in the worst case scenario, you show up on the local news for some reason <laughs> and that's in the search results. That would not be a good thing. Um, unless you want it to be. Okay. So, um, okay. So I'm going to go over some really easy ways to, uh, to take control of these search results. So, uh, who, let's see. So, so the, the first thing is to, um, is to establish a good professional social media presence or professional digital presence, right? So this means Twitter, but it can also mean academia.edu or LinkedIn. Uh, these social networks have good SEO. Who knows what SEO means? Search engine optimization, great, yeah. So that means that when a website has good SEO, uh, it will pop up really high in your search results. So uh, that means that, that Google trusts them, the website is reliable and popular. Um, from scratch, if you make your own website, uh, SEO takes some time, it takes some elbow grease, uh, and it takes some degree of popularity. Um, but you can piggyback on other sites' great SEO. So, uh, so that means creating profiles on the CUNY Commons, filling out uh, your own profile here at JJ, making spaces for yourself on networks like Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, at some point the uh, uh, CUNY Academic Works, ResearchGate, and elsewhere. These sites will always come up pretty high in Google search results. Um, you don't necessarily have to do all those things or be active on all those networks. That would take a lot of time and energy, uh, but you know, the more that you uh, put into curating your digital presence, the more it'll pay off and the more comfortable that you will feel uh, with how you look to the internet. Okay. Uh, and you know, sometimes you can fill out your digital presence while having a great time and being somewhat academically productive. And that's my segue to talking about my favorite thing, which is Twitter. Okay, who here has a Twitter account? A lot of hands, great. Uh, is this a Twitter account that you're active on? Have you tweeted today? Yeah, yeah, great, yeah. Who's been tweeting during this presentation? <laughs> awesome. <laughs> okay, so some of you are very familiar with Twitter, some of you maybe aren't. Um, I'm gonna go over some of the basics uh, for, for how academics use Twitter. I'm not gonna talk so much about etiquette or sort of the like nuts and bolts, um, but I will go over sort of the um, Big picture thing. So Twitter is one of the most useful academic tools I've ever used. 
Um, it keeps me up to date on research and uh, fields that I'm interested in. Uh, it introduces me to peers doing work that jives with mine. It starts incredibly interesting conversations that I would never have had otherwise. Uh, and it introduces me to people that I may or may not have met in real life. Um, the best way that I can describe Twitter is that it is the best parts of an academic conference. Um, on Twitter, you can link to your scholarly papers uh, and other academic outputs. So that's you know, kind of like delivering a paper at a conference, uh, taking questions about it or receiving comments. Um, but it's also the, the uh, introductions to other people that usually happens in between papers. Uh, or, you know, mostly it's, it's, the, it's the really energized conversation that happens at the pub after the conference is over for the day. That's when you're sharing exciting ideas and meeting new people. Um, it's, it's arguments, it's, it's one-liners, it's questions and answers. Uh, okay, so you may have seen this Nature article about how academics use Twitter. Probably you can't really read it from where you're sitting, but I'll just tell you. Uh, this is their breakdown of why uh, the 300 surveyed academics use Twitter. The top reasons are following discussions, posting work, discovering peers, and discovering recommended papers. Um, there are also a few other benefits to uh, using Twitter as an academic as well, uh, including interacting with people that you have an intellectual crush on. <laughs> so let's take a look and explore what Twitter looks like. Let me see if I can... Okay, so I've opened up my profile, and the reason why I've opened up my own is not because I'm necessarily a great example of how academics use Twitter, but because I feel more comfortable poking around my own site than like someone else's that I haven't really warned. Um, okay, so on Twitter when you sign up, you have a username or a handle, like mine's Robin Camille. You have your real name, you have a blurb about you, you have a link. Uh, and you have your profile timeline. So these are all the tweets that you've ever tweeted in reverse chronological order. So when you scroll down, you're scrolling back in time, like to just now when Megan was presenting. Um, the other timeline that shows up is on your homepage when you sign in, right? So these are all of the tweets from people that I follow. Let me see if I can make this a little bigger. Okay. Um, What's at the top is always refreshing because people always be tweeting. The concept of following is pretty strong on Twitter. You can follow other people and they can follow you. It sounds a little creepy, but it's not most of the time. Um, your account can be private or it can be public. That's up to you. But because we're talking about your digital presence as a scholar, mostly we're talking about public profiles, right? Okay, so you may have, uh, you may have heard that a tweet is like a tiny comment that is 140 characters or less, but what does it actually look like? Uh, let's take a look at some tweets that I have favorited or liked just to see some examples. So here we have people sharing others' academic work. This is uh, an article in Plus One. We have life milestones, like somebody binding their dissertation, super exciting. Uh, interesting links, we have a, a conversation. This was a joke about what I would have done if I had been there when somebody proposed in the stacks in our library here at John Jay. Uh, so, okay. The, the best metaphor that I found is actually from one of CUNY's own sort of Twitter rock stars who is Jessie Daniels. She's at Hunter and the GC. Um, so she wrote this great short article, 10 Things About Twitter for Academics. That's, you know, kind of an introduction. Uh, and number five, I think, uh, is pretty great. Um, figure out what you want to contribute. There are a bunch of metaphors that are useful for explaining Twitter. One of my favorites is DJ. Think of yourself as a DJ and the tweets that you're putting out into, into the world as your playlist. What effects do you want to have on the people who are listening? Uh, I tweet about race and racism, that's her academic interest, uh, and also about academia, higher ed, digital media, documentary films, and memoir writing. So that to me is sort of a great example of uh, how to sort of conceptualize this weird thing of Twitter and tweets. So in, uh, in addition to being uh, a place to read and write stuff, Twitter, I say, augments real life connections. Um, one way that I always use Twitter is at academic conferences. So who else has been tweeting during conferences? Yeah, yeah, I, I, it can be a little bit distracting sometimes, but it can also be a great way to sort of uh, take notes and sort of read what other people are thinking too. So, for example, um, many conferences like MLA will have their own designated, oops, designated hashtag. 
right? So if I look for hashtag MLA15 from January, uh, I'll come up with lots of MLA-related tweets. And if they're big enough like MLA and they have a lot of concurrent sessions, every session will also have uh, its own hashtag, like hashtag S400, right? So this is a way for you to sort of keep track of, say, what, what the speaker is talking about. It's a way for you to share relevant links with other people in the audience, sort of ask questions and start conversations as it's happening. It's pretty exciting. And uh, if, say, you can't get travel funding to go to this conference, this is a great way to follow along right from your desk. Uh, and, and be sorry that you can't be there. Okay. Um, so let's, let's take a look at some conferences that are happening today, like right now, to see what's happening. One that I'm keeping track of is Emerging Technologies for Online Learning. And that hashtag is hashtag, oh, oh no, I misspelled online. Um, hashtag ET4, the number four, online. So on your, on your various devices too, if you want to take a look at this too, just to sort of follow along and explore. I won't be offended if you're staring at your screen the whole time because I kind of expect you to. Um, so let's take a look at what's happening here at this conference that I wish that I were at. Okay. People meeting each other, people sharing some links, sharing, you know, point of view photos of Dallas. Um, sharing their research, sharing others' research. Okay, so this is a pretty big conference. Oh, cupcakes. Um, but if you, you know, if you're interested in it, you're following along, either right there, then and there, or from home. Okay. So, uh, again, Twitter's all about following, right? So you're following people that you're interested in. Uh, they probably won't be tweeting about their work all the time, uh, but it's useful to follow along with their works in progress or things that they're reading, things that they're interested in. Um, when you sign up for Twitter, it's kind of a snowball effect of finding other people to, to follow along with, right? Sometimes Twitter will suggest it. Yeah. So the question is uh, whether, whether I would recommend having separate accounts for your professional life and your personal life. Totally up to you. I do. I definitely have a private Twitter account that's just mine and only, you know, my close circle of friends take a look at it. Uh, and that's, you know, honestly, it's the place where I'm mainly complaining about my day, you know, complaining about my commute or whatever, things that I know no one who looks at me professionally wants to really see. But, you know, it's also, it's a nice way to sort of have your own private space in a very public area. Yeah, yeah. Well, so again, that's something that is uh, a balance question, and it's, uh, it's something to kind of explore, right? Like, you're right, it is pretty dry to just be tweeting links to things that I've written all the time, and I'm not talking to anyone else or, you know, making myself human at all. Like, Twitter is great for that. Twitter is great for, for, for humanizing you and sharing things, you know, outside of the library, say, that I would be interested in. Um, so it's... Uh, as far as the sort of public-private sharing things that you're interested in, things that you're not, um, people probably don't always want to hear about your cats, but maybe they do. Uh, um, you know, it's, it's also kind of hard to ascertain what kind of feedback you're getting if you're oversharing, right? Unless someone who's, like, is really honest with you and telling you, oh, maybe you shouldn't share, you know, all those cats that you have. <laughs> 
<laughs> I know it's kind of a non-answer, um, but I, you know, what I also what I also do is uh, um, take a look at, at other academics, people whose whose uh, sort of Twitter activity I, I admire and I follow a lot, and see you know what what they do. So. As a gift for you today, I've put together a uh, sort of starter, uh, st starter kit of academic Twitter, um, including some people here, right? Uh, so, you know, not all these things are really academic in nature. Some of them are current events, some of them are news. Oh, thanks for tweeting, Megan. Um, all right, kind of, yeah. Right, you know, uh, I actually have, I should have printed this out. Well, these slides are online. They are, can you see that? Uh, they're at jjay.cc slash social OAR, OAR in uppercase. And, and the links are, are all there too. Or you can go to my Twitter profile and take a look at my lists. And social OER starter kit is there. Okay. Um, okay. So when you're just starting out on Twitter, one thing I actually recommend that you don't do is uh, follow a lot of mainstream organizations. If you follow like CNN and the New York Times, uh, first of all, you're going to just get like a fire hose of tweets because they're publishing stuff like every minute, and you're going to feel really overloaded. Um, but to me, also, that's not really where the value of uh, of Twitter is the, the the real value of Twitter is is in the social part of the social network. It's it's a community of real people that you're connecting with, whether that's over your research or over knitting, right? Um, okay. So one last thing I also want to sort of show, uh, as far as Twitter goes, is that you can keep track of topics too, not just people on their research or conferences, but sort of these these ongoing conversations. So uh, hashtag that you'll see a lot is hashtag Twitter historians. which is historians tweeting, tweeting about things on Twitter. Oh my gosh, what is that? Okay. Um, so, you know, as you're, as you're using Twitter, you'll be finding these, these kinds of ongoing conversations that you can take a part in and sort of see crop up again and again. So, uh, so maybe let's talk about a question that some of you might have in the backs of your minds and has kind of come up before. Um, who's been keeping tabs on uh, Steven Salaita? Yeah. Can you give us a brief synopsis of, of what the deal is? Totally. Yeah, yeah, this, this to me is a real question, I think more of academic freedom than of social media, but uh, one, of the, one of the sort of, I guess, takeaways from this really terrible scenario is that saying stuff online is saying stuff in real life, and there can be consequences, whether they're fair or unfair. Um, so, uh, you know, in, in that case, I think that, that, that there's not a lot to say about social media, but there are plenty of other instances where you know public figures or other academics uh, have tweeted a bad tweet, you know, something that that may like denigrate someone else or makes an off-color joke. Um, and sometimes the the consequences of a, of a bad tweet can stick around even after you delete it. Uh, there's no solution here that I have to offer, aside from remembering that just like in real life, you know, we should be kind and generous at all times whether that's you know, being kind about other people 
in my tweet or being, being kind of generous about seeing someone else's kind of iffy tweet and just sort of letting that alone, right? Um, so uh, I, guess, I guess all I just have to say about that is be, be careful and be kind and generous, especially when you know, you're at a sort of tenuous point in your life, like getting a job. Okay. Uh, last thing about Twitter, are there any social scientists in the room or linguists? or political scientists, people who are interested in lots of you know, word data. Uh, well, for you, Twitter is a gold mine. Um, it has, it has a, an, a, another use besides just connecting with people. It has a use as research data. Uh, Twitter is kind of like a firehose of people making comments all the time, and they're geotagged, and they're tagged with date time, and they're sort of interconnected. It's really, uh, it's, it's an amazing data set. So I just want to kind of throw that out there. If you're interested, uh, I'm happy to talk about you know, using Twitter as research data, but I won't take up too much more time with that. OK, so maybe at this point, you're all feeling a little bit Twittered out. And I've said it about a 1,000 times. Uh, I can't say tweet too much more, or else I'm going to explode. OK. Um, oh, yeah. So, so the question is about hashtags and whether it's something that we create or follow along with. What the heck even is a hashtag? So I will say this. Twitter is its own weird little world. And there are all kinds of social conventions that happen in this weird little world that you don't really see maybe anywhere else. And one of those things is hashtags. I find them kind of difficult to explain, but the best way that I can explain it is um, when you write out this hashtag in your tweet, which is just as simple as putting the you know, number sign and then some letters after it, it's kind of like you're sorting that tweet into some category, whether that's real, like the category of a conference that you're at, or it's ironic, like, you know, the yellow train is down this weekend, hashtag sad, right? Uh, is that sort of getting there? So you, you can make up your own. You don't have to choose from some set list. The only, I think, relevant advice for hashtags, they can be anything you want. They can be your entire tweet if you're you know, making a joke. But if you are, say, creating a hashtag for an event, like today's event, for example, uh, it should be as short as possible because you don't want people to have to type out the whole thing in their tweet, which is a limited size, right? Today's hashtag is social OAR, in case you missed that. <laughs> but then you create it beforehand. So yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, yes. So, so this is a question about um, about where you put your your at. That's, that's what I'm going to call it. Your at. So, you know, should, if if we're talking about today, should that be at John Jay Research is hosting an event today? It's totally great. You should come. Or should it be um, come to this great event today hosted by at John Jay Research? And the only difference there is that if you put that at at the front of the tweet, only people who follow you and John Jay Research will see that. So that's most useful if you are having a conversation with someone and you're kind of just like have this conversation thread that you don't want like everyone that you follow to see, only if they're interested in you and that other person. So sometimes uh, on, on Twitter, I wish I had an example, uh, you'll see that someone will say, for example, um, dot at John Jay Research is hosting an event today. And they only put the dot there because they want people uh, who follow them to see this whether or not they follow John Jay Research. It can be anything, but I guess the, the convention is just the dot. 
So this is another thing that kind of takes like trial and error almost and just spending time on the Twitters to see you know, what people usually are doing. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll take more Twitter questions at the end, but I am just gonna sort of blaze through the rest of this so we have time for, uh, for the CUNY comments and more Q&A. Okay, so academy.edu has come up before. Who's got our profile on academy.edu? Okay, about half the room, cool. Uh, so um, this is one of the primary social networks uh, for academics. I've logged into my account here. Uh, you know, people, people say that it is like the Facebook for researchers. You, you follow other researchers, they follow you, and you know, instead of on Facebook, you're posting photos and status updates, here you're posting your research. You're posting your talks, you're posting documents. Uh, you're posting published papers. Um, I'm not even going to touch the rights thing, uh, but all I'm going to do is show you what I think is a great example um, of, of a profile here on academia.edu. Um, so you'll see this researcher, Jesse Snommel, has posted lots of papers, he's posted lots of talks, he's pretty active. Uh, and one thing here, I don't know if you can see this, uh, is this little eye icon followed by a number. As you might already know, that will denote how many people have looked at this paper or talk in particular. Um, so if you're interested in altmetrics, that is to say alternative measures of your academic output, uh, that's going to be a really important thing for you. Um, and I'm going to encourage you all to go to one of the following workshops for OAR, which is on altmetrics, starring our very own Marcia Blodick here. Yeah? Okay. Um, so you can learn more about that at that workshop. Okay. You know, I'm actually not sure. No, I think it's, it's, in like, it's in reverse chronological order, sorted by what kind of thing it is. So here we have talks, then we have papers. Below that, we'll have teaching documents, posts, and at the very bottom, we will have the CV. Okay. Uh, I'm not an expert on academia.edu, so I'm just going to go to the other thing that I do know more about, which is your John Jay profile. So all of you have a profile here at John Jay. I have to say one of the great things about the new website is that they've made this profile a lot more flexible. So for example, I'm going to search for my colleague. search for her in the directory is going to bring up her contact info, but also this little blue eye, which connects to her faculty profile here at John Jay, and she has put a lot of work into this. She has uploaded a picture, she has a bio, which is pretty extensive, and she has a list of her publications, which are all very impressive, some of which are linked. Um, and at the very bottom, she has her CV. So I know that a lot of you have already put a lot of work into your profile, maybe in the previous system, but all I want to say is that um, on the new website, you can log in here at, uh, here at this URL, which is the John Jay website slash user slash login, uh, and you'll see that there are a lot more things that you can add to your profile besides just, say, lists of publications or your bio. We can add Sorry? We can add yeah, yeah, it's on you. Uh, I'm, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna lie. There, there have been some some issues with this, uh, with this system. But they're very responsive uh, at Do It, and they're happy to fix any issues with uploading and with making sure that your profile is the way that you want it to look and connected to who you are in the directory. And I would just point out that you know, institutionally, we do have a, now on the new website a search function that will search only this database. Yep, so, sorry, here we are. Um, we're not in the right place here. 
So we do have a research page here, and I'm not sure why it's not showing up. The uh, it's going into mobile view. That's the problem. All right, here we are. So on the research page, if you look over here, there's this picture that doesn't really look like a button that we are going to work on to make sure that it does. But this takes you to uh, a, a Google custom search that can search faculty's uh, research interests in particular. Uh, somebody throw out a research interest that they've been careful to include in their profile? No one? Justice. Well, justice is going to be a pretty broad one. Um, eyewitness is a good one. And we will get a few people up. Oh, not with that, but. So we do have a number of folks in our psychology department with expertise in this area. And lo and behold, they all come up. However, I, you know, this is a, a search that's sorted by relevance. So, you know, depending on how many times, for instance, it shows up on your profile, you might come up first or you might come up last. Uh, something to think about. Again, this is another search engine that can be optimized. That's great. I, I did not know about this. This is, this is wonderful. So this is even more incentive for you to really fill out your John Jay faculty profile. Uh, it will show up here in this searchable database on the John Jay website. Uh, it'll be pretty high in your Google results if, you, if, you, you know, if you're using your name. Uh, and um, so it's a way to make yourself look good, your department look good, and your institution look great. Okay. So to conclude, uh, oh, oh no, okay. Uh, take control of your digital presence. You can do this. You have the tools at hand. It doesn't take too long. You can do it. Uh, establish professional profiles on places like academia.edu, John Jay, and Twitter, my fave. Uh, and take some time to engage in the social network. Share your work. Discover new research. Discover peers. Uh, and connect with other people. Okay. Uh, do I have time to take any, any questions, or should we move on to the comments? Anybody do, who here uh, that does not have a profile knows what the Community Academic Commons is? Oh. Why don't you have profiles? <laughs> That's what I want to know. Um, so I'm Michael Br uh, Branson Smith, and I also am using the middle name because if you're a Mike Smith, you are not finding yourself online <laughs> amongst many things. And this is Sarah Mogano. the uh, social media accounts on the Commons. And um, we're gonna, I'm going to give a really quick description of the Commons by showing you what it does. Um, the CUNY Academic Commons uh, has an affinity for uh, projects like Academic Works because they're also deeply invested in ideas of openness and open source um, and making things readily available that you completely control. Um, CUNY Academic Commons is built for and by faculty and staff of the Commons. So this is very much a product of CUNY. The, the project staff itself is all part-timers. There's a combination of faculty and, um, and people that work for CUNY, and then uh, a couple of people that are formerly from CUNY but now are just outside consultants. Um, it uh, it's uses software that, if you don't, may have heard of it, called WordPress, which is an open source piece of software, um, and also another one called BuddyPress. And these are important because those fit in that context of openness that this is code that is freely available to anyone on the planet that uh, may use it. And so it's built on that. But very quickly, what does it do? Um, you create a profile in the Commons, and um, I'm not going to log in uh, because I would, and we'll just look at the most recent uh, active profile. 
And so this, this uh, person is the Seattle Assistant Director at uh, City College. And she, by default, you get what's called a quick link, uh, CUNY.IS and uh, Capley, all right? And you can control that and change that. And this was our little, uh, does anybody remember the CUNY is campaign? This was a, a, a campaign by CUNY Central. It was a way of like showcasing uh, the kind of celebrity faculty of, of CUNY, and they'd say, CUNY is, insert celebrity faculty member X, and CUNY is, insert celebrity faculty. And then it was also CUNY is John Jay, CUNY is, which was nice. But we, this is what's called a domain hack, and because uh, the .is is the Icelandic uh, 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 top level domain, and you all are CUNY is, if you wish to be. And in a, in a profile that you control, you can share academic interests, you can, um, you, you share by default, um, whether you're staff, faculty, or also a, a graduate student, because by default it's for faculty, staff, and graduate students. So undergraduates are not part of the commons. So if you were looking to teach a class there, you, you can't do that. Um, the big thing is that uh, within every, uh, within the commons, everybody can do a, a bunch of different things. You can work on blogs or sites, and you can be part of creating sites. So if you've ever wanted to build a site for a project that has some CUNY affiliation or personal affiliation that you want to put in a context, and you have control over, and you don't want to ask your IT department, <laughs> you can just do it. Um, there is no, uh, no one saying you can't do this. Um, we trust by default if you have a CUNY.edu account, you can make a site. Uh, built out of WordPress, which is incredibly flexible. You can have what are called posts, which are sequential listings of uh, information about uh, the project, pages, which are more like website uh, pages, and then also you can make it look in a variety of ways through themes. Um, gosh, we gotta go fast. <laughs> um, and then, let's go back, um, we're using uh, poor Nat Natalia. Uh, the, the other, the last thing, and this is the last one I wanna say, is the, um, What's great about the commons is you can join what are called groups uh, based on uh, any uh, interest. So this person's uh, interested in a lot of edu educational technology related activities. And in any group, any group is you can create a group, join a group. Groups are either uh, public, private, or hidden. A public group means anybody that's in the network can join it and see everything that's happening in that group's network. If it's private, that means it's by membership. It's, you see it, you know it exists, but you can uh, request to join it or you can build a project around it. Say you have a departmental-based project and this, you want uh, other uh, faculty and staff to get together and, and work on a project together, they can do it in this space and, and there's uh, discussion forums and, and, and collaborative document building, not unlike uh, Google Docs, uh, that are available to you. Um, and then hidden, say you have something that you want to work on behind closed web doors, you can do that um, and then maybe at a certain later date make some of your activities public, whether it's in the form of a site or a public group and things like that. And it's a way to collaborate. The big thing is you can collaborate across CUNY. And so I'm going to stop there, even though there's a lot more things you could talk about. Um, but I'm going to give Sarah a chance to talk about what she does and what we, uh, and, and you can ask questions. Okay. Um. All right, guys, um, so I'm actually going to log into my profile here just to give you a sense of what it looks like um, for members, which I hope you will all become soon. Yeah, we have some lovely uh, uh, totes and notebooks that are brand new. Can you have a comment? Please grab them. Oh, I want them. Okay. So, Don't work on your swag. <laughs> <laughs> so when you log into the Commons for the first time, um, and this is actually a, a, a pretty new feature that we have, it's called My Commons. And what it does is um, any groups that you uh, belong to, any blogs that you have created or that you follow, um, any friends that you've made, you will see their activity here. So um, it's, it's like a dashboard that has a lot of relevant information um, as soon as you log in, and uh, I think that's that's a really nice feature of the site that's new. Um, I did want to show you guys my profile. Okay, so um, you can see here you've got like um, a little blurb that you can write about yourself, and I ha um, I have hyperlinked to the Twitter accounts for CUNY SBS and the CUNY Commons. Um, what's also nice is that. Uh, 
you can use the profile page as kind of like your hub, um, your academic hub. So all of the stuff that you've created, um, you know, stuff you've done on academia.edu, um, you know, stuff that you've posted to Flickr and, and you're on LinkedIn and YouTube and Twitter, um, you can, you have the ability to um, add these to your profile. So if, uh, if you send people here, they're able to go out um, in to, and see all of the work that you've done. <clears throat> You'll also uh, have the ability, we um, have these new, uh, what are they called? Like widgets. Um, so uh, you can add your academic interests and you'll notice that uh, you know, these interests are highlighted, uh, hyperlinked. So when I click on them, it's going to take me to a list of members that um, share that same uh, academic interest. So it's a great way to connect with other like-minded folks. Um, then you've got your positions here, and I've also um, added uh, a Twitter module that links uh, to my Twitter feed. Um, so I'm just going to click on that real quick. And on my Twitter, um, I also use this area um, uh, somewhat like the profile on the Commons, where I hyperlink uh, to the uh, CUNY SBS Twitter account, CUNY Commons Twitter account, <coughs> and I also explain what I'm going to be tweeting uh, so folks know what they're getting into. So I tweet about higher ed, technology, pop culture, politics, and life. And then I use my cuny.is slash Sarah Morgano link to take users to my profile. Um, and I also have an Academic Commons business card that is it's very minimal. Um, it's got my name, it's got my title, and it's got my CUNY is link. Um, I also use my CUNY is link on uh, digital signatures when I'm sending out emails. So, uh, you know, a lot of people are able to get to my profile and uh, learn more about uh, uh, me and my academic interests. Yes? That's right, but very good point because you do have the ability to um, click on edit. You can change uh, who has the ability to see what, and it's very fine-grained. Um, it, it used to be just everything was public, and that, that is what it is. But now you have the ability to, um, right now everybody can see that, um, but I can change it so that only I can see it, only members that are logged in can see it, and only my friends that are logged in can see it. Um, so I actually, this morning, uh, updated my email address uh, and changed it to from everyone to all members because I've been getting some spam email. So that way, and I don't really need everybody to see my email address. So only members that are logged in can see my email address. And you can see, I mean, it's, it's fairly straightforward. Um, if you have like a Facebook profile link, you just um, cut and paste the link into there and then it'll show up as an icon. Um, if you're on GitHub, it has that as well. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot, and also, you know, if there's another network or anything that you would like to be included on your profile that isn't listed there, one of the great things about the Commons is that we, we love feedback. Like, we want to hear what you guys want and how you want to use the Commons. So, after you sign up for an account <laughs> and explore a little bit, um, you know, take, write some notes, see what you like about it, what you don't like about it, and, and share that with us because we would love to get feedback to make sure that you know, we're serving the, community, the CUNY community the way it wants to be served. And um, just lastly, I did want to um, show you that the Commons does have its own Twitter feed. Um, that's not what I wanted to do. <clears throat> so if you go to News Twitter, is this cool little built-in page here. Uh, uh, so what I've done here is, well actually not me, one of our developers, has embedded um, one of the lists that, I've, that I curate on the CUNY Commons Twitter, Twitter page. So if I come across anybody that um, either has CUNY in their profile or it looks like they're affiliated with CUNY, I will go ahead and add them to the list. And then this feed right here um, is, I mean, you can see John Jay Research right on top. Um, and you can scroll through that. And it's a really great way to find, you know, people with similar interests and just learn more about different topics. Um, and so if you wanted to see just CUNY Commons tweets, we've got that there. And I just wanted to show one last thing. Those are also on Twitter? Yep. 
Yeah, the idea is like it's a, a, a list is an, uh, a curated collection of um, members of Twitter um, that you're seeing their, the, the, those, those people, the, those individuals tweets a whole of And the individual is loosely used because sometimes there are accounts for like say John Jay Research. Okay, and so this is called Hootsuite. It's um, like a social media managing tool so um, because I manage multiple accounts and don't want to have to log into each account, and this is especially good for people if they have like um, a, a public Twitter, professional Twitter, and they also have a private Twitter, you're able to manage it with something like this. You can schedule them at specific times. You can have um, you know, multiple accounts in there. Um, and, it's a, and this is also a great way to keep track. You can create um, different streams with lists. So even just for personal use, this is helpful rather than having to poke around Twitter so much and you know, click back and go forth and, and all of that stuff. So that's, that's pretty much it. Oh, uh, and uh, all of our, our tweets do have the cuny.is URL, so you know that they're legit. <laughs> and um, one of the uh, hashtags that I've tried to push is um, hashtag CUNY events. So whenever I'm posting something on the commons and it's event related, I will put the CUNY events hashtag. So if, if you plan on tweeting about an event, if you want to include that, if you can. Oh, that's something we should mention too. It's like, it's a, a feature that was often asked about was how can we find out about events on the commons or public, uh, promote or let people know about events. And so that's a perfect example of like, oh, well, we should build that. So since it's open source software, and we don't have to ask for someone to make this for us, we build it ourselves. So there's going to be an events feature where you can basically enter an event, uh, if you're a member of the Commons, and it'll be part of a, a CUNY-wide calendar, and then there'll eventually be ways of kind of controlling your own calendar so it shows certain and do you, do you know when that's going to be rolling out? I know they're, I they're working the on end, it now. Yeah, I think the end of the, by the end of the semester. I that's think it's great. coming out by the start of the summer. So, I mean, that, that's one of the exciting things about the project is it's constantly evolving, as Sarah described, in response to the community, community and how we think they might want to use it or how they tell us specifically they'd like to see it um, uh, work. Um, and I, I did also just want to add that, um, you know, my, my job uh, managing social media is, is really to get you guys out there. Um, if I see something that's interesting that I think others should know about, I tweet about it. Um, and I usually tweet between seven and 10 tweets a day. So um, a lot of, I, I, I don't know if you know Tony Picciano, but he has a blog on the commons and he blogs daily. And so I'm constantly, um, tweeting out stuff that he's written. And if they're on Twitter already, I can include their Twitter handle. So that way when people read, read the tweet, they can go and see who the person actually is rather than just reading their name and having to Google it. So um, it's, it's very connected and uh, I, think a, I think a good thing. <laughs>